Hello, and welcome to another episode of Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains. You know, I've been telling stories now for five years on mysteries, and uh, today we're standing at five million views from all over the world. I mean, there's hardly a place you can name that we haven't had a response from, and we're quite proud of that. You know, um, I started telling stories of my personal adventures into the mountains with Tom Colin Bourne and others, and I never really thought anybody would be interested in, in things like that, but uh, there, there have been a lot of people that uh, seem to enjoy some of those stories, but I'm about out of those, those personal experiences after five years of telling them. So a couple of years ago, I took a deliberate tack in trying to separate fact from fiction. Now, you know, I don't think I've ever mentioned it before, but I'm not a Dutch hunter. I never have been, I never will be. When Tom and I founded the museum, I thought that I ought to have a working knowledge of the area. And it proved to be very useful because, you know, scores and scores and scores of Dutch hunters would come into the museum to look at our collection of maps, look at the books, some of the manuscripts that were never published or were out of public publication, we reproduced them and they could buy those, those manuscripts that so many people had written. And as I listened to their stories and, and read some of these things, I began to realize that there were some pretty distortion, pretty bad distortions from author to author, from manuscript to manuscript. And uh, we finally got a hold of the Barks Notes and the uh, Holmes Manuscript and the Cavanus Diary and uh, began to really study some of these things. Even though I'm not a Dutch hunter, does that mean I don't believe in what we're talking about? There is plenty of evidence. Jacob Waltz is a real person. You can go back and look at our stories about that. Uh, a couple of our, uh, genealogists and, and that lived in Germany, whose father also was a genealogist, they've tracked this guy down and got all the information on him. And the real Dutch Jacob Waltz surfaced, surfaced rather than the, the ones that uh, had been mistakenly brought forward. And the gold under his bed was real. The jewelry store that bought it was real. The people that assayed it was real. There's just a tremendous amount of information that you can't deny about the Lost Dutchman legend. On the other hand, there's a lot of myth involved in this. And f quite frankly, a lot of people have died following misinformation in the Superstition Mountains. And that's one of the reasons that, that I like to get rid of some of this myth that goes out there. Um, this brings up the point, uh, you know, there's so many books and every one of them has misinformation in it. And the, the manuscripts, the Barks Notes, Tom Collinborn had four copies of the Barks Notes, and he wasn't even sure he had the right one because every one of them was different. And some people claimed there were six different copies of the Barks Notes. And uh, one person said there was seven. Six were typed and one was handwritten. Well, I'd love to see the handwritten one but because that's probably the most authentic one. Uh, anyway, uh, Sim Zeely comes to the picture. Sim Zeely was uh, an author of the Lost Dutchman Mine book. And uh, he had quite a background. And I'd taken a couple of shots at Sim Zeely. And I may have to do a little apologizing here, just a little, because I've learned some things about Sim Zeely that, um, that's fascinating. You know, uh, Sims was uh, born in 1862 in Tennessee. His dad was a Confederate soldier who, who survived the war, and he was pretty much self-educated. But he they moved to Kansas, and he became one of the youngest editors of a newspaper that there ever was. And um, 
He was the editor of several newspapers in Kansas and Colorado, and and he uh, eventually became secretary to a Kansas senator. And he was also on some kind of Kansas Water Resources Board. And uh, that job there led him to accept an offer to come to Arizona and be, uh, become the Water Storage Commissioner for Arizona. Now, this was in 1895. Of course, Roosevelt Dam was built in 1911. And uh, he was taken up the Salt River. They found the place where the best place for a dam would be. We've got a story on the whole Roosevelt Dam construction thing that you can go back and look at. He became a secretary the to, to the territorial governor. Uh, he became uh, the territorial auditor. He came, became Arizona Railroad Commissioner. He was on the Resources Board, which led to the Salt River Project. He was representative for the Colorado River Project. He was the chief clerk of the Federal Land Bank. And he was city manager at Boulder, Colorado when Boulder Dam was. Yes, Boulder Dam. I don't call it Hoover Dam. <laughs> uh, this, this guy was, had an impeccable uh, character. And it was hard for me to, to come across and think that a man like that could distort anything, as I found in his book, The Lost Dutchman Gold Mine. And uh, not very long ago, I received a copy of a book that is unpublished from Steve Bowser, who's uh, a, an acquaintance that's become a friend of mine. And Steve had went in uh, kind of like Hank did. He took all the newspaper stories of Tom Collinborn and combined them into a book where they were easy to read. So Steve came up with this publication and um, it shows on the covers, the pictures on both covers of all the major players in the Superstition Mountains about the Lost Dutchman Gold Line. And he went through all the journals of the Superstition Mountain Historical Society and took all the stories of the individuals that are pictured on the covers and uh, combined them into one booklet where it's easy to get to them. Now, I have every journal that was ever published by the museum. But listen, if you, if you want to find a story about a certain person, you got to go through every one of them to find it. But here, it makes it real easy to come up with. And I read something in here that kind of grabbed my attention that I uh, wasn't quite aware of, and I'm going to read it to you so that you get it straight from the horse's mouth. Sim Zeely uh, sent his book in to, be, uh, to the publisher in 1950. It came out in 1953. But a plethora of letters that Sims received following the book's uh, publication speaks volumes of how the book affected so many people and how they took the book as gospel. The Eli file is full of letters and proposals, sometimes offering new men of information, and many took and take Sims' book to heart as the history telling the absolute facts of the Lost Dutchman mine. Unfortunately, this is not true. The book, The Lost Dutchman Nine, is not what Sims submitted to the publisher. It is not history. When the book first came out, it was classified as historical fiction, a factor that's missed by just about everybody who read the book. In early 1950, Sims Ely received a three-page communication from the publisher, John Wiley, at William and Morrow and Company. It was not a love letter. The publisher just rips Ely up one side and down the other. It was, it was clearly stated in here that the publisher was only interested in fixing the book so it would sell. And letters begin to come back and forth between Ely and the publisher uh, requesting changes and things. 
And Ely got so disgusted with the thing, he finally turned the book over to the publisher. Some chapters in there were reduced as much as 50%, 60%, 20%. The book was much shorter than what Ely submitted to the publisher. And the entire story was really written by somebody who didn't know a thing about the subject because he had admitted that Ely had a real grasp of the information that he was putting in the book. So I'm gonna wrap this up with this, with this statement. Hundreds of people have lost their lives in the Superstitions Mountains looking for a lost Dutchman mine that may exist, but the information on how to find it is just mostly myth. And that's what I have been trying to present here on these stories. And we have, we have run across, you know, the Holmes manuscript was flowered up by the newspaper man that wrote down the information so bad they refused to have it published. And some, he was burning some of the pages to start a fire out at the Quarter Circle U Ranch where he worked. And somebody found the manuscript with all the missing pages and turned it over to another newspaper man who had to finish the story without the information that was originally there. It, it's the same with the Barks notes. As I told you, there was six or seven different copies of the Barks notes and each one of them was different. So which one of them is the truth? We'll never probably know which one of them is the actual truth, but people have, have used the information in there to bolster what they believe should be the case and, and have, have just end up with just more, more myth. One author takes information that another author, author writ earlier and has distorted it even worse. So as we continue here, uh, we have cleared up a lot of things, but as we continue here, when I find some myths, folks, I'm gonna tell you about it. So we'll see you down the line. Thank you for watching this episode of Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains.